good morning first service. Today uh, has the potential to be a very good day because the famous groundhog has predicted an early spring. And not only that, odd makers have predicted a Kansas City win over San Francisco in Super Bowl uh, 54. But no one has of yet predicted a short sermon at Mount Gilead <laughs> this morning. I said today has the potential to be uh, a good day. I couldn't help myself. I, I had to do it. I saw the title on the article, and I should have just skipped over it, but when I saw the title, I had to read it. It was how to stop those annoying problems of church growth. I mean, what kind of a title is that? How to stop those annoying problems of church growth. In other words, how to intentionally uh, make your church get smaller and cause people to leave. So I read it. And worse yet, I'm sharing it with you. Um, here's some of the suggestions. Um, begin every sermon with the phrase, you know what's wrong with you people? Or start that year-long sermon series on all the dietary laws in the book of Leviticus. Or uh, place a, uh, a polygraph, a lie detector machine on the front row to be used during the invitation time. Or if your uh, auditorium slopes downward like ours does, give every kid under 12 a handful of marbles before uh, the service. Go to uh, one cup at communion during flu season. Uh, some Sunday morning, just open up the floor by asking, so, uh, does anybody here have any complaints? <laughs> give, give the back row the ability to gong anyone that's on the stage. Uh, Put a blank for height and weight on the information cards. Uh, and in order to make it feel casual and relevant, say, you know, or dude, 15 times from the pulpit each Sunday. Have the musicians play hockey cheers at pivotal moments in the sermon. Uh, charge usage fees for the restroom. And put all decaf coffee in the cafe. That's how to stop those annoying problems of church growth. And I, I would just add one more today. Uh, make another plea and preach on serving again. Because we talk a lot about serving around here. Uh, you might say some churches are accused of talking about money all the time. Uh, we get accused of talking about serving. And you might say, you know, you know, talk about that again. Come on, we have served more. We've been partnering with organizations in the community. We do Chick-fil-A and Bundle Up, and we just did Giving Tree. And there's at least one big event for people to serve every quarter. And we talked about new opportunities today. And last fall, you did a whole series on this called Serve More, hashtag Serve More. You have opportunities to sign up weekly. I, I think we can give this subject a rest, all right? Well, the reason we consider serving together today is because serving was a part of Jesus' lifelong rhythm with his disciples. In fact, Jesus said, uh, I am among you as one who serves. And we've been asking how Jesus made and built disciples, and if we want Jesus' results, we need to use Jesus' methods. So let me remind you where we're at so far in this year 2020. This is week five. And for the last four weeks, we have suggested not a string of insurmountable resolutions, but some simple built-in rhythms that are seen in the life of Jesus as he called and made and led disciples. And we've been framing these all along as rhythms over resolutions, not demanding to-do lists. We're building daily life practices and Jesus rhythms into our days and into our default mode behaviors. And we keep referencing uh, Bobby Harrington's seven rhythm cycle. And uh, so far, uh, we have considered the rhythm of prayer in Jesus' life. We've considered the constant rhythm that he displayed of inviting people along with him, whatever he was doing. And last week, we had, uh, much to our delight, the opportunity to talk about the rhythm of uh, eating together. And today, we hear and we attempt to catch the unmistakable beat, the rhythm of serving that permeated the lives of Jesus and his disciples while they were on this earth. Now, if you didn't know uh, anything about Jesus and you picked up a Bible and you started reading through the Gospels, 
the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. This aspect of Jesus' identity is one of the first things that you might notice, especially if you started in the Gospel of Mark. Because when you start in the Gospel of Mark, you get to chapter 1, verse 1, and he's introduced. He's baptized in verse 9. He defeats Satan's uh, temptations by verse 13. He's already preaching by verse 14. He starts calling the first four of his disciples in verse 17. And he casts out demons and he heals people the rest of the day, even Simon Peter's mother-in-law, all the way through verse 31. All that in the first chapter of Mark. Sounds like a good day's work of serving and uh, helping, doesn't it? But he's not done. You get to verse 32, and this is what it says. When evening came, after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill and those who were demon-possessed, and the whole city had gathered at the door. And he healed many who were ill with various diseases, and he, and he cast out demons. And he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. So not only did he serve all day long, when evening came, after the sun did set, then the whole city came to his door, and, and Jesus served even after the sun set. That's just in Mark chapter 1, and he's just getting started. He was serious when he said, I am among you as one who serves. And he was serious when he said, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. And as Jesus did these things, his disciples who were with him watched and they participated and on some occasions even tried to do it by themselves. And later, the great apostle Paul would urge believers in Philippi and by extension urges us to catch that rhythm of serving together. In Philippians chapter 2, he says, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being found in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. I mean, this rhythm is all through the life of Jesus. And it's like, um, this rhythm is like a syncopated rhythm. A syncopated rhythm is a rhythm where the accent or the beat is placed in a place where you wouldn't normally think it should be. And here we have the Lord of the universe giving up his place in heaven, not only to live as a human being, but as a servant. And he focused on the values and the interests of others, and he let go of rank and status and privilege, and he moved toward total obedience. Jesus was a servant. It was a rhythm in his life and in the lives of his disciples. And then when we talk about Jesus as a servant, we think of that quintessential moment in John chapter 13. Maybe your mind has already gone there to where Jesus washed his uh, disciples' feet. Verse 4, John chapter 13. Jesus got up from supper. He laid aside his garments, taking a towel. He girded himself, and then he poured water into the basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel uh, with which he was girded. Now, we could just stop right there. Think about whose feet Jesus washed. He washed the feet of Peter, whom he knew was a denier. He washed the feet of Thomas, whom he knew would be a doubter. He washed the feet of Judas, who he knew would betray him with a kiss. In fact, it says that Jesus knew that right there as he began to wash their feet. He washed the feet of James and John, the sons of thunder, who sometimes had an attitude instead of serving, of saying, hey, let's call down fire from heaven and burn up everybody that doesn't agree with us. And Jesus got down on his knees with a towel and a basin and did the common hospitality step of the day when none of the others had bothered to do it. Here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking that 
that this moment in the life of Jesus, if we understand it correctly, that it could help us. It could help us get rid of that perpetual, entrenched self-orientation that we all have. How often do you notice that in yourself? I called it a perpetual, entrenched self-orientation. It's human nature to make it about us. How do we catch Jesus' rhythm of service? And, and how does this uh, merge with our desire to be and help other people be disciples of Jesus? Well, I think it might be helpful if we go back to the beginning of the text because we started in verse 4. But if we go back to verse 1 of John chapter 13, it sets up what Jesus did when he, when he washed their feet. Look at it. Now, before the feast of the Passover, Jesus knowing that his hour had come that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And during supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus knows that too. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and that he was going back to God. I think there's something for us there. If you want to catch this rhythm of service with Jesus, you, you have to know your identity. Jesus was able to get down on his knees and serve because he knew where he came from. He knew where he was going. He knew what he was there for. And when you know where you come from and your purpose and where you're headed, when you're confident in your identity in Christ, it frees you and even compels you to serve. And the rhythm begins inside. See, Jesus knew his authority and his purpose. He was sent by his Father. He was returning to God in heaven, so he served. He washed feet. And when you're confident in your identity in Christ, it frees you to serve. We know that we belong to God, that everything we have and we're able to do is our own accomplishment. It's, it's not our own accomplishment. It's from God. In fact, uh, sometimes what we tend to do is we tend to um, accomplish things in the flesh instead of in the spirit. And that's, uh, that's something that can happen for preachers. If we start preaching in the flesh instead of in the spirit. But even the opportunities that, that, and the abilities God gives people in the flesh are from God. Everything that we have comes from from God. He, he not only created you, but Ephesians 2.10 says that he has designed you for good works. And as followers of Jesus, we share his purpose and his mission. And we know our reward is in heaven and an and, and eternity that we don't deserve, but one that's assured by his grace. And his servant heart starts beating within us so that I can know I'm not going to remain the selfish person I used to be. He is transforming me. I have new priorities, a new spirit within me. He's making me into a servant, overcoming my self-focus. You are the recipient of Jesus' love and Jesus' ministry. And when you know who you are in Jesus, then you can start to feel that rhythm because a servant doesn't serve for payback from those he served. Servant doesn't serve to impress. Servant doesn't serve with expectations for accolades when the servant's just doing what the servant's supposed to do. Servant doesn't serve for merit. The servant is to be selfless. And we can do that when we're confident of our identity in Christ. See, I'm not too good to serve, but I'm good enough because of him. So this rhythm of service, if we're, if we're going to become as disciples, this rhythm of service starts with knowing our identity. So when Jesus washed the disciples' feet, you remember what, the, what uh, Simon Peter said? Simon Peter said, oh, no, 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 Lord, you shall never uh, wash my feet. In his mind, it was not right that Christ the Lord should wash his feet like a common servant because he thought it was a contradiction of Jesus' identity and role. But what this text tells us is that this was not a contradiction of Jesus' identity. It was a manifestation of his identity. And when we understand that God has made us his servants in Christ, then we're able to serve together. Richard Foster, famous author, says, there is a difference 
between choosing to serve and choosing to be a servant. There's a difference between choosing to serve and choosing to be a servant, and it's true. When I choose to serve, I retain control about who I serve and when I serve and why I serve. But when I choose to be a servant, I respond to whatever needs the Lord puts in front of me and desires me to respond to. An elderly uh, couple from an impoverished neighborhood in Louisville, uh, where my uh, son-in-law Tyler preaches, um, called uh, for help last October. Uh, They needed help uh, clearing uh, fallen debris from their backyard in order to forestall eviction. And they called six different organizations. And six different organizations uh, ignored their calls for help. And the government was their last hope. They actually got through to the mayor's office. And after being denied by six different organizations, they got through to the mayor's office. And the mayor's office gave them this advice. They said, call Northeast Christian Church. That's what the mayor's office in Louisville said to these people, call Northeast Christian Church. So they did. And my my son-in-law says that happens all the time because at their church, they don't just have a serve day, they have a serve uh, DNA. It becomes part of our identity. Now, Verse 1 of chapter 13, this whole foot washing uh, narrative is interested, interesting because, uh, and I don't know what translation of the Bible you're reading from, but if you're reading from the NIV, the uh, early edition of the NIV, this is how it's translated. Uh, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Right before he washed their feet, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Other translations say, he loved them to the end. The Greek word is teleos. It means complete or mature. And so some translations translate it. He now showed them the full extent of his love. And others translate it. He loved them to the end. Either way, how can washing feet be the full extent of his love? Or loving them completely? So, so let me just say right here, if you want to catch this rhythm, you not only have to know your identity in Christ, but you have to appreciate that you are loved and that you have been served. That you're also a recipient of these things. See, I, I don't think the foot washing act is the only thing that's implied here when it says he showed them the full extent of his love or he loved them to the end. I think the foot washing merely inaugurates the whole series of events that is unfolding toward the cross. And it illustrates the extreme, selfless, need-meeting love of Jesus' life, especially the cross. And the foot washing was a dramatic portrayal of Jesus' rhythm of serving. It's a display of the beginning of his complete love for his disciples and consequently for us. See, before asking the disciples to be foot washers, Jesus stooped down to wash their feet. And it must have felt uncomfortable to have Jesus washing their dirty feet. But he insisted, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. God on his knees before me humbles me and strangely can make me more God-centered. You see, if my only view of God is the fact that he is the supreme king at the summit of the chain of command, a king on the top rung, rung of the ladder... It could actually make me more self-centered and preoccupied with me because I'm always wondering how I'll get up to him and worrying about how I'm doing. Am I making progress toward him? How do I make my way up to him? But God on his knees in front of me, serving me, taking care of my needs, that shifts my focus. Now, I'm not worried about being good enough. He's taking care of that. I can focus on him and his goodness and his glory and his mission. And that's why later Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 says this, Christ's love compels us. He died for all. Listen to this. He died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. 
And later in John 13, Jesus said, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. See, if you, if you want to catch this rhythm of serving with Jesus, you, you have to, like him, know your identity. But you also have to realize that you have been loved and that you are loved and that you have been served. Because when we're truly convicted of what Jesus has done for us, then we're compelled to lay down our lives for others. We love because he first loved us. And one of the most powerful ways to overcome the priority of self, that entrenched self-orientation, is to be overwhelmed by the love that Jesus has for us, and then we can live for the well-being of others. Well, let's read on, verse 12. So, when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, uh, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet, for I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. To catch this rhythm, you just got to start washing feet. Uh, it, it's washing feet, but it's not washing feet. It's an imitation of Jesus, but it's not an imitation. It's a blessing, but it's not just for the blessing. You, you won't catch this rhythm unless you start doing it. You, you stoop down low and you get your hands dirty blessing others. It, it, it's a position of selfless influence. And Jesus becomes evident when we lay ourselves down for others. And as we wash feet, others follow in our way and wash someone else's feet. It's a rhythm we can catch. And Jesus concluded by saying, truly, truly, I say to you, a, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is the one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you're blessed if you do them. If you, uh, if you were to go online and you were to Google for articles about people taking selfies, you want to talk about self-orientation, uh, you would find that nearly every major news outlet and all kinds of organizations have written articles bemoaning of how self-obsessed Americans are and this whole phenomenon of uh, selfies. With the advent of the cell phone, we're constantly uh, sharing and showing pictures. Showing the world selfies. You show us our friends, you show us your puppy, you show the world your coffee, you show us your food, you show us your grandchildren, you show us your screenshots, you show us way too much. What if we were bent on showing people Jesus? I don't mean with our cell phones. I, I mean with our lives. What if we adopt a serving mentality over a, a selfie mentality? So what I have here with me today is a little diagnostic test. And this will assist us in determining, discerning whether the servant heart or attitude is developing within us. And so I'm going to give you some, some uh, negatives and some positives. So let's, uh, let's, let's start with the deficiencies. There might be a deficiency. Uh, in your servant heart uh, when you justify the absence of serving in your schedule, uh, when you start naming all the stuff you already once did or do, uh, when you serve or uh, but complain about it, uh, when serving is just a check the box kind of thing to make you feel less guilty, um, when you're mad if you're not seen or recognized when you serve. Or, or here's one, uh, when you humble brag about it. You ever seen somebody humble brag? You know what that is. It's, 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 it's when they talk about themselves, but they do it in this humble sort of way. They manage to tell you everything they're doing uh, and sound humble in the process. If you have a martyr complex, if it's more about your passion and fulfillment than others, when people would probably be shocked if you volunteered, or when you only serve in certain arenas, probably when there's some benefit to you, or when you don't think of serving and theology as being connected. You know what I love seeing here? I love watching some of our most theologically astute uh, teachers and scholars serve in other ways, and it happens all the time. Now let me give you some positive things. The, these are ways that you know you're growing in your servant attitude. Uh, when you find joy in seeing the benefit to those that you serve. 
when there are times that you can const, uh, confidently say no because you know you often say yes. Or when you serve in a capacity that nobody sees and nobody knows about, and that's okay with you. And when you understand that, that serving is doctrine, right along with sin and sovereignty and stewardship and salvation, when you look for opportunities instead of avoiding them, when your service starts to give you a platform for truth-telling, when, when serving is a consistent part of your attitudes and your actions and your identity, and when you serve even though you could easily just pay it done. Some of the most powerful, accomplished, even wealthy people I've known in life were servants. When it would make a noticeable difference if you stopped doing it. Here's a big one. When you don't take your ball and go home just because you aren't serving in the job you wish you were serving in. And when you see serving as, as a gift. Now, as, as I make this list, both negative and positive, faces and names come to my mind for all of these and I, I think we have some world-class servants, or maybe I should say celestial-class servants at Mount Gilead, and I'm thankful for that because there's something about serving together shoulder to shoulder. And some of your best relationships and your best friendships can come when you serve together. Back in, uh, back in December, the student ministry here had a big disco night. Now, let, let me explain. They rented, they rented equipment which included individual headphone sent, uh, sets for each of the 100-plus students who were involved that night, and they had a party. But here's the kicker. The individual headsets were connected to different DJs playing different music so that all the students were not hearing the same tune. And with those headphones on, they were singing out loud, which is comical enough when you're wearing headphones. And they were dancing to the music that they heard, but the words and the music were different for each one because it came from a different DJ. So you had over 100 kids singing and dancing to entirely different beats and rhythms. It's, it was hilarious. But this, this rhythm of serving is a Jesus rhythm. And if we all get on the same page harmony and beauty and glory will follow and the sweet music will not only be pleasing to God it'll help us help others toward lifelong disciplehood it worked for Christ and his disciples then and it still works today it's attribute and attitude before action and it's action that is born out of that essence and attitude famous commentator William Barclay said here's a timeless truth whether we like it or not Every Christian is an advertisement for Christianity. By their life, they either commend it to others or make them think less of it. And the strongest missionary force in the world is a Christian life. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Jesus said, for who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. And Paul to the Galatians said, you were called to freedom, brethren, but don't turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. This idea of serving together, it's not a checklist item. It's not an image builder to appear servant-like. It's not a way to uh, soften our guilt, our conscience appeaser. It is a rhythm from within. I'm asking you today not just to choose to serve, but to choose to be a servant. It's not a PR stunt. It's not a photo op to promote the church or its budget or save on advertising costs. It's not for bragging rights so we can beat our chest and be the most exciting game in town. It's not to make people indebted so they feel obligated to hear our spiel. It's not a sales gimmick just to trick you into implementing an ulterior motive. In fact, when we serve, we remember that evangelism is our ultimate motive, not our ulterior motive. It's not a temporary fad. This, this church has been full of people serving since 1835, and Lord willing, people will continue to serve from this place long after all of us are gone. It's not to earn points with God. We're saved by grace, not works. It's not the gospel itself. Rick Russo writes, good works can be the bridge, but they're not the saving message. Good works are the complement, but never the substitute for the good news. 
Serving is what we were made for. It is what real believers do. It is what will bring kingdom results. It is what helps prove our sincerity and our authenticity. It is what meets needs and gets the job done. It is a demonstration of the gospel. And it is actually sometimes noticed by the world. And it's always rewarded by God. And it starts with knowledge and identity and attitude. It starts with one another. It starts with doing together. So let me conclude with the words of the Apostle Peter. The one who didn't want Jesus washing his feet when Jesus started. Later he would write, 1 Peter 4, Whoever speaks is to do so as the one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's offer ourselves to him as his servants today in prayer. Would you bow with me? Father, thank you that we are loved and served by you. Thank you for the identity that you give us in your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, today, thank you for the opportunities that you are going to place in our paths, even yet today, to wash feet and to serve. And Lord, may you instill this rhythm of serving together uh, into our lives. And may it make a beautiful, beautiful harmony for your kingdom, for helping us and others to become lifelong disciples of Jesus. Lord, we give ourselves to you as your servants today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great day. Go out and serve today.